Hello, I'm John Atack, and I think probably people on this channel know that by now. And I'm extraordinarily pleased to welcome Janice Gillam Grady. Hi, Janice. Hi, John. Good to talk to you again. Hmm. So um, <clears throat> you've written a couple of books about your your time in Scientology, and you worked with Ron Hubbard. You were on the ship from the age of eleven. You were one of the original Commodore's messengers at the age of twelve, um, and um, you spent most of your time for the next what 10 or 11 years in the company of yes they're about so you have a yes. unique unique perspective um i'm going to bring up a, a couple of things because it seems to me that during that period of time there were two elements <clears throat> of ron Hubbard's life which, which we know occurred which don't seem to have been prevalent and the i'll give you the two things the first is his involvement with ritual magic there is no doubt that in 1946 he performed an, you know, a ritual in the attempt to incarnate the Antichrist, uh, Babylon, the Scarlet Woman. Um, right. There's also no doubt uh, that, from his own admissions, that, that he had a bad problem with barbiturate drugs. He talks in a lecture about having become addicted to phenobarbital in the 1952 lecture. And he also, of course, was doling out handfuls of, of amphetamines of speed in 1950. Now, my understanding is that, that you saw, saw nothing of, of drug use with Hubbard. Would, would that be right? Or, other than painkillers? Yeah, that, that's positive? correct. Hmm. Well, there, was pay, there were painkillers uh, a few times, you know, when he broke his ribs and his shoulder. And, um, but otherwise, it was... There was no drugs around. There was no alcohol. Sometimes he had some alcohol. If he'd been up on the bridge and it was a cold night, we'd come inside and he'd just take a swig of whiskey or brandy or mm. something to warm his insides up. But other than that, and I even checked with other messengers. I'm like, did you see any? And I checked with Commodore Stewards. Did they see any? And I checked with Ken Urquhart. Did they see any? Mm. And none of us saw it. Now, Kimma and Jim Dinkowski have both said there were times they gave him pain medication, mm. but none of the other stuff. And I actually know of people that were kicked off the ship for having pot. Mm. There was there's two people I know of that that happened to. Baron Berez had had something to do with that, yeah. Bar Baron Berez and John O'Keefe were the two that I know of mm. that. Uh, were caught with pot, and it was drugs were a no no in mm. Scientology. But people did have alcohol, though that was not, you know, promoted or anything. You just couldn't go in session for 24 hours if you'd had any drugs or alcohol. And I know Hubbard went in session nearly every single day. So, and if he had been on painkillers, he wouldn't go in session. And if he'd had that drink the night before coming off the bridge, he didn't go in session the next day. He followed that same policy. And it, it, it's fascinating. I, I, many years ago in, in the 80s, I interviewed Virginia Downsborough twice. And she told me that, that she went to Gran Canaria towards the end of 1966, um, having yeah. had a desperate call from Ron Hubbard. And that when she got there, she found that he'd stopped eating he'd stopped drinking and he was su surviving on she said a shelf load of drugs and um i spoke with david mayo all back in 2013 and he said she'd told him what was on that shelf and and i i'm you know i'd be very interested and what seems to have happened is that and and you know okay my perspective is that to dream up something like ot3 <laughs> Yeah, you have to be on drugs, you know, there have to be something seriously <laughs> wrong going on. But that he got himself into a terrified state, according to Virginia, you know, that, that he was, you know, the, the body thetans are taking over, I don't know what's going to happen, you know. And she had to sort of pull him back together. And she said that, you know, he then invited her to join the Sea Project. And she said, uh, no, thank you, you know. But the weird thing for me, and this was yeah, really strange is when I interviewed her, um, the friend who was with me started to say something rather loud. And, and she said, be quiet, there are people doing OT3 in the next room. So 
she still believed and was still promoting this idea despite right this this view but there must have been a very sudden turnaround where either he came away from it you know i mean i've all, also heard stories about gene denk at the end of his life and was it or oh, steve mm -hmm. jarvis during the the years aboard the ship, right, filling out prescription pads for him. So, Steve so, Jarvis. I think it was Jarvis. He was a doctor. Um, I could well be rem misremembering because it's more than thirty years ago that that I interviewed somebody about this. Um, so it could have been that he had medicines, but but I would have thought that as a messenger, and certainly when you were on watch, somebody would have noticed something if he was you know, even popping codeine or something for, you know, it would have been noticeable. So, and then at the end of his life, it said that he had cirrhosis of the liver through, through alcohol overconsumption, which you know, might have been, you know, the drinking bouts with Pat Broker in the last years. But there is this anomaly. And of course, he was also a very heavy smoker, wasn't he? A hundred cigarettes a day. Oh, so, yeah. You know. oh. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you know, here, here's here's my my kind of view or information I have or whatever. Um, I had met him at St. Hill mm -hmm. in 66, 67, but it was 68 when I actually went to work for him. Yeah. And as a messenger, we had access to everywhere, including his cabin and his auditing room when that was built, you know, all his closet space, we had access to all of it, his desk drawers, you know, whatever. And I never saw any of that. Mm. And even his bathroom and the medicine chest in the bathroom, I never saw it. Mm. Now I know I went on, um, I had an interview about a month ago or something, and I, and one of the people in the interview was, an ex druggy who'd gone to prison for drugs and that type of thing. And he's trying to tell me that when there's an addiction, that person will know where to hide the drugs and that you can look and search, but you won't find it because they have it all figured out. Well, as I tried to tell him, Hubbard never went ashore without a messenger. Mm. So there's no way his drug dealer or whatever could hand him anything and he could slip it aboard because he didn't even really go ashore. Mm. He had no connections with anyone ashore. Mm. Anyone he communicated with or saw, there was always a messenger there on the ship. Mm. And those are people on the ship and you got to get aboard with the drugs in order to get them to him. And then once he's got it, where's he going to put it when you've got stewards who have to dust every nook and cranny? With a white glove. With a white glove. So where are you going to hide it? Hmm. And he can't carry it with him all the time because the stewards are going to, when he get changes into his pajamas, the stewards are going to take the clothes out, you know? Hmm. There's no way he could have hidden anything hmm. or even gotten it. And then on someone saying, oh, no, well, up on the bridge, he was snorting cocaine. No, that was his cabin up there. And he only used that on rare occasions if if his cabin down below was messed up or when he recorded uh, Ron's journal 68. Mm -hmm. But he, he rarely used that bridge cabin. So it wasn't a place for him to go snort coke. And where's he going to hide the coke anyway? No. So... And, then, you know, and then I check with different other people going, well, is there something wrong? And I was just so naive. I didn't see it. Well, we were all naive and didn't see it then. But he had some hell of a deal worked out with someone sneaking him stuff because no one ever saw it. Yeah. So I mean, there is. I mean, Jerry Armstrong um, some years ago told told me that um, Hubbard was using Demerol, which is um a pharmaceutical form of, of opiate and that would have come in a bottle in pills um so i mean the, the idea that he'd be scoring cocaine or um you know 
some <laughs> other opiate, which I'm not allowed to mention apparently because YouTube will drop the video if I do. Oh, okay. Bizarre. Um, so you can be a hero, but you can't be the female version of that because um, you're in trouble. But uh, there's no sense of that. But the idea that he, he might have had something, for me, it's very important. And you, you mentioned Ken Urk, uh, Urk and um, he and I have crossed swords a couple of times, but I, I've tried to make it clear to him. I, I tried to get him to write his memoir a few years ago. And he was saying, well, look, everybody believes all of these other things that have been said about Hubbard and, and Ken is still fond of Ron Hubbard. And so there's right. no point. And I said, that's why there's a point that, you know, my, what I've done is, is not to demonize Hubbard. I'm not, it's not, I'm not interested in that. It, and there will be different perspectives. You know, we all witness things slightly differently, but it's to give a truthful picture. And so I think it's right. It's very important because a very significant personality shift seems to have occurred with Ron Hubbard when the Sea Org, or the Sea Project as it originally was, put to sea that, you know, we got to overboarding, throwing people into the sewage in, in Corfu Harbour as, as some sort of spiritual practice, you know, where Dianetics was meant to get rid of trauma and here he is traumatising people. He seemed, oh, yeah. <laughs> he seemed to become tyrannical. And, and that's not the story I had from people who knew him in the 50s or even in the early 60s, but that when he had his own little sort of island of, of people with the ships in the Mediterranean, he, he seemed to become you know, full of rage very frequently, giving mm -hmm. people severe reality adjustments. And I wonder, if, I wonder if there's any coincidence there that maybe he was, you know, because certainly in the early 50s, he repeatedly recommends amphetamines. If you have to grab hold of anything, grab hold of benzodrine, um, with the mistaken right. thought that this makes people more um, focused and more alert, which to some extent it probably does. But, um, and then as I say, he, he talks about having taken barbiturates. We have him trying to cash a prescription for Nembutol in 1965 in East Grinstead, signed Dr. L. Ron Hubbard, shortly before he renounced his doctorate. Um, and, you know, we know that that's what he was taking when he was in Oaknell Hospital in 1944, 45. Maybe the, that personality shift has something to do with the change in, 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 in what he was doing and how he was behaving. But, okay, the other aspect, and I, I'm yeah. very glad to have, have got to that. I think it's important. The other aspect is, is the magical aspect. And this is really contentious, but there is so much, you know, Scientology is, as far as I'm concerned, a reworking of the ideas of Alistair Crowley. I, I wrote a paper called Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, um, relying to some extent on Jeff Jacobson's wonderful work in that area. But where Jeff had said, well, look, here's a technique or an idea that exists elsewhere. I said, can I prove that Hubbard knew about that source? And I was able to show that, yes, he did. Um, and a great deal is found in Crowley, the past lives, the, the trauma of birth are both there. The, Beginners TR zero um, is a practice that, that the Crowleyites have, but the essential practice of magic is the idea of elevating the will, so that you will be able to intend things, you'll be able to make things happen. And when we come to Scientology, that's the core that you'll have magical abilities where you your intention will, you know, be fulfilled in the world. The only thing I know of that directly connects with ritual magic is the Kali ceremony on board the ship. <laughs> I was going to, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. So t tell us about that. What you know about that? Well, you know, it, it actually surprised me when he came up with that because nothing magical had come up before, mm. you know, he, he'd never talked about hypnosis or mag black magic or any of that stuff. And then suddenly he comes out with this Kali ceremony and I'm like, where the hell did he pull that from? Because I'd known him so long, but I don't, I had no clue of his past. Mm. You know, I'm just a young kid and you just don't know, you know, the only things you hear is what he says in his lectures. Mm. So when he came up with that, it was like, wow. And then it was like, this is evil. 
So, so um, when, when was the Kali ceremony? Tell us the uh, circumstances of it. It was in the early 70s, and he had Laurel Watson, who was his public relations person, and that kind of surprised me that he had someone doing public relations actually doing this because, and she didn't want to do it, mm. you know, but to her it was like, you know, you do it or your job or, you know. So she set up this whole Kali uh, idol that people let, have let to me, get on their knees. Let me interject. Kali is um, the black goddess of the Hindu religion. Um, she is the, the goddess of the thuggies, who give us the word thug, who in worship of Kali murdered, it is estimated, about 40,000 people. So Oh, Kali... I did not know that on the... <laughs> yeah, but she she was yeah, a black goddess. Mm. Yes. And auditors who had messed up before, you know, on the class eight course, if they messed up and didn't get a well done session, they got thrown overboard. So now we have these interns on board. And when they didn't get good sessions, they had to go and take the PC folder and stab the PC folder in, in front of Kali as part of this ceremony. And it was actually very um, engramic mm. to all these auditors yeah. that had to yeah. do it. Yeah, very traumatizing. And then it expanded to the programs chiefs for the different orgs and continents. They had to then also get down on their knees and, you know, get off their sins to Kali and stab, stab the program fold of their orgs. And... I remember standing there watching it going, this is not Scientology. This is not what we're being told. Where, where did he come up with this? You know, and, and people, you just don't talk about that type of thing because if you do, you're now bad-mouthing Hubbard and you're now countering intention. Countering so you just kind of, keep it quiet because you don't want to be the person who's the next offloaded off the ship for going against what he said, you know, and for me, as in, and the other messengers, we're all there with no parents mm. and, and nowhere to go. So it's like you, you walk the straight and narrow unless you feel comfortable enough to say something and know there's going to be no reflection back on you for it. Mm. And there were times, you know, that that could happen. But yeah, I just, when it happened, it was like, where is this coming from? It's like out of left field, nothing I'd ever seen him do before. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he calls Alistair Crowley, my, my very dear friend <clears throat> in a Philadelphia doctorate course. I'm sorry that word doctorate really gets to me. Six weeks listening right. to Ron Hubbard and you've got a doctorate. Not really. Um, but he he talks about Crowley and he defends Crowley in those lectures. There are three statements about Crowley. Um, he later talks about Jack Parsons, with whom he did the um, attempted to incarnate Babylon. And there is the Crowley was um, rather like people who believe in the perennial philosophy that this idea that. <clears throat> The gods and goddesses, the deities rec represent certain forces. And so you can look into any mythology, any religion, and find a comparison. So um, Hubbard performed something called the blood ritual, I think in 1946, <clears throat> when Omar Garrison was being attacked by Scientology in the attempt to get him to return the 10,000 or so private Hubbard documents that, that he'd been given to write the biography of Hubbard. Um, right. He actually came to see me. He arrived on my doorstep, having flown to England without any appointment, knocked on the door, and there was Omar Garrison. And he said, I'm tired of them kicking my door in, um, trying to get me to give this stuff back. Uh, so I want them to know that I've come to see the infamous John Atack and that if they do this again, I'm going to give you all of the documents. And as a proof of good faith, here's a copy of the blood ritual mentioned in the Armstrong case in 84, where Hubbard devotes himself to the goddess Hathor, 
it's handwritten in Hubbard's handwriting. I wasn't allowed to copy it. I wasn't allowed to make notes or anything. But right. It's a blood ritual. He gives his blood so that he will be devoted to Hathor. Now, in the Crowleyite system, Hathor is, is an Egyptian goddess and, as with many uh, deities, has two, two faces. And publicly, she's seen as the spotted cow who feeds all of humanity. But privately, among the, the priests, it is said she represented the destroyer of man. And Hubbard and Crowley conflated Hathor with Babylon, as in the book of Revelation, with Artemis, the Greek god hunter god, huntress goddess, with Diana, and I think Dianetics and him calling a child Diana may have something to do with this, and with Kali. So th this is, he talked about the Empress, he, he told, I interviewed a woman called Jo Scott, who in 54 was his uh, secretary in Fitzgerald Square. Um, Fitzgerald, Fitzpatrick, I can't remember which Fitz it was, but in London. And she said, you know, 30 years later, she told him, she said, he, he said that, that Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, was automatic writing. It was dictated to him by the Empress. What does this mean? And by that time, I had some idea of what it meant. This is Kali, Hathor, Babylon, Diana, Artemis. Um, and this bizarre idea that in the background of Scientology, there's a man who is seeking to incarnate the destroyer of mankind, seeking to bring the end days. And yet, you know, how do we fit this together with what he did? You know, he, he most certainly did perform rituals. He most certainly had these beliefs. You know, Jerry brought the affirmations out where he's saying men are my slaves and elemental spirits are my slaves or right. body thetans as we would later know them, know them. So it's as if he was all the time having to pretend something and that behind this were a set of beliefs which he never shared with us you know and the, the thought is had he abandoned those beliefs and then we come to the kali ceremony and we go well what did that mean to him what what was he what was he doing and i start to feel that maybe and this is an awful thought that maybe we were the sacrifice that maybe enslaving us physically and psychologically, certainly psychologically, maybe enslaving us was his way. It's, some, it's a few years ago, Marty Rathbun, for whom I've never had any time, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. But Marty, in one of his blogs, put forward this idea that maybe Hubbard was seeking apotheosis. Maybe he was, you know, wanted to be a god. And I wrote to him, I didn't get the courtesy of a reply, but I wrote to him and said, if you look at Blue Sky, which was published in 1990, you will see exactly this idea put forward that in Chinese religion and in ancient, in, in classical Rome, it was believed that if people repeated your name, you still existed. And then we find him, you know, he leaves $648 million in his will, $500 million goes to the Church of Spiritual Technology, which is perpetuating the name Aaron Hubbard. It's making sure that he'll be remembered, which right. seems a little pathetic, actually, I must say. It's like, it seems childish, you know. But his, what he taught, what he said, and what he believed don't seem to have been exactly the same thing. And the Kali ceremony pokes its way through this and you know, sort of gives us this quite different perspective of what Scientology is. Yeah. Well, there's two kind of sacramental type ceremonies that he did. One was the overboards, because yeah. that was done as a ceremony. Commit mm. your sins and errors to the deep and hope you arise a better Thetan. And then the person gets thrown over. It's true. So it's that's true. two different ceremonies. Now, are there? I don't remember any other ceremonies like that that were sacram as um, yeah, sacrificing everything else any other ceremony would have been you know the naming of the ship and breaking the bottle or whatever but you know that's just a standard ceremony yeah. or an officer ceremony that type of thing but just those two 
and which were very much against the beliefs of Scientology or what I was raised to believe. But then even the condition formulas with the with the rag around the left arm mm. or the chain around the wrist or the the black mark on the cheek for treason, all those were symbols of some sort. Mm. And he started that before the Sea Org. And in talking with Ken, where we kind of were noticing changes with him, one was in England where he was an un undesired alien mm. and then he'd been kicked out of Rhodesia. He was trying to get too involved with the government in Rhodesia and he'd been down there trying to get land and a hotel and stuff like that but, but, and gets involved with the government let me and gets kicked the, out. The, he got kicked okay. out as far as I understand it because you know, this is where he said you, you an, an OT can't survive on his own in about Rhodesia, but he wasn't on his own. There's a man called Morley Glazier with him, and I interviewed Morley. And um, Hubbard told him to break into government offices, something that he would, you know, a fair amount of would happen later, and he got caught. And right. so the, the real reason that Hubbard was thrown out of Rhodesia was that he tried to burgle government offices and they they couldn't pin it on him because Morley kept quiet right. about it. He'd told him. Morley, I, I believe, went to prison for that. Um, so, but but yeah, as you say, yeah, an undesirable alien in Britain. That the French wanted him in court. That there was so much going on, and that that pressure would have. You know, he's he's trying to find somewhere that's safe where people can't catch him, and a paranoia. Right. Can, uh and and he's built this whole thing in his head on how he's trying to do this stuff good for mankind, but he keeps being attacked because he's got this valuable knowledge. And this is, you know, and he's the founder of the knowledge. Mm. And, and he's also can't go back to the U.S. for tax evasion. Yep. So that's, so where do you go? Oh, let me get a ship, you know. So off he goes to see where... Now he's in international waters and he can't be gotten. Yeah. Now that's where Ken Urquhart noticed a personality change. Yeah. And it's also during those Rhodesia days, I believe, that he started coming out with the lower conditions and the penalties for that. Fair game. Yeah. Right. So it's all in this whole time period. Mm. And then um, when we're on the ship, when he in December 73, I believe it was, he had a motorbike accident. Yeah. And when he came back from that motorbike accident, I was there because I helped grab the bike when he got back and went up to his cabin with him. And he had told me, he said that that morning at breakfast, Mary Sue had told him he could not go back to Spain. So here's another incident of being kicked out of a country. And now we've got all these less ports to go visit, you know, that we could be safe. And he, he says, I went on PTS to Spain. So, you know, to that whole thing. So Spain I look at it and it's, it's like getting kicked out of countries and nowhere to go. Mm. And that's where... Like after that motorbike accident, oh, his temper flared up like crazy. He always had a hot temper, but it got worse. And that's when he accepted Ken Urquhart's to establishing the Rehabilitation Project Force. And then he then came up with the RPF's RPF. Mm -hmm. that, that was LRH because... Joan Moreau refused to go to the RPF, so then Hubbard assigned her to the RPF's RPF and not wanting to be a part of that group. And that's when I started noticing when he got well, physically well, mm -hmm. he then came out with being source. So instead of being the founder all those prior years, after that motorbike accident, he became source. Mm -hmm. And all these source missions were sent out to brief the world on who he was. And that was more of the godly type figure and that type of thing. And these missions went to every org in the world 
doing source briefings. And that is when everyone would stand up and clap to a photograph. That started, and each of those missions had to report on the amount of applause. And the longer the applause, the more successful. Yeah. And that became a thing on any source briefings and stuff. How long did the audience clap for? Yeah. But uh, and that that was a total shift in personality from founder to source. It's it's a good point, and 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 source, you know, this idea that was coming along in the early '60s that any important ideas had come from him. Um, that you know there have been many suggestions, all of them minor, and. Um, there's an auditor, I think it's auditor number four with Beth Fordyce on the front, explaining that she's been awarded a Doctor of Sci Scientology degree for making a contribution, but it's a minor contribution. And you then kind of go back and, and look at the, say, the beginning of uh, Science of Survival or Scientology 8008, where you've got a great list of people, um, including Anaxagoras, I'm not really sure why, who, who contributed. It's very obvious when you study the work of Josef Breuer uh, that Freud started with, that Dianetics is a reworking of Breuer's therapy. And uh, it had catastrophic effects for, for uh, Anna von o, who was the first person who was put through it. She ended up in asylum after receiving this. Freud, in a lecture before World War I, explains chains, engrams, repeater technique. All of this stuff is there and says, we stopped using it very early on because it makes the person more dependent on the therapist, not less, which is what you know, we're trying right. to do. So the idea that now it was his idea, even though in, I think it's the year that he was born that Freud gave the lecture saying why, why he wouldn't do it anymore. And, and so many other things where he will, for example, say, you know, the cycle of action comes from the Vedic literature. And then he's saying, no, it's me, I'm the source. And I think that ultimately that leads us to that, that bulletin that was very quickly removed from OT8 after it was issued, where he's claiming to be Lucifer and the Antichrist. Um, now, the, let, these... me bring, let me just interrupt here mm, surely. on OT8, yeah. okay? I don't know how much of that OT8 was Hubbard. I think it was Ray Mittoff, because, but, I, but I think there are paragraphs that come from her. But well, hang on. But were they taken out of context? Because when Ray was putting OT8 together, Ray had told me personally, we had a whole conversation about it. He was telling me there was just a whole bunch of different notes on different things, and he had to try and figure it all out. Mm -hmm. And he hoped that he had gotten it right. And that was OT8. It was yeah. not something that Hubbard laid out this, 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 this. No, it was a whole bunch of different notes yeah. that God knows what note went with what. Yeah. That Ray had to figure out and try and compile into one thing. Hmm. I mean, I, so, I, that's my understanding that, that OT8 is a concoction uh, because there, there was no such thing. It's just that opening bulletin, which I think was removed after a week. Jesse Prince um, talked about it. And he, of course, was theoretically the head of the tech. And he said, but they didn't show it to me before they released it. Then people that first week started doing it and left because of this issue. Um, one of the people who, who did it has, has published on that subject. Um, and, and Jesse confirmed, yeah, you know, that. I think Nancy Manny, who was with Jesse at the time, this is what, 2015 when I talked to them, that she'd been through that first thing when it came out and she said, that's Ray, that's Ron, that's Ray, that's Ron. And Jesse said, how do you know that? And she said, I handled, handled so many telexes from Ron, I know how he says things. And then there you've got this bizarre statement about being Lucifer and the Antichrist, which one might sort of push aside if it hadn't been for what he did in 1946 when he was seeking to incarnate um, the, right. the, you know, the whore of Babylon. Um, but, but who knows what did he intend exactly with that? Because in order to notes, 
they're summarized. You don't write out the whole thing, and you know. So it could have just been Ray's interpretation of what it meant. That's a, yeah. it's a total unknown. And yeah. well, Ray Midoff would know the answer to that. Mm. He's the only person that will. And he ain't telling. Um, but no. <laughs> the, the sort of grandiosity we we I interviewed John Sanborn, who I really liked. I really got on with John, and he said, you know, in 1954 he took on publications and he held publications till 1978, and he said, and then he was asked to transfer yet another ludicrous sum of money into Ron Hubbard's personal bank account, and he said, I've been living on five dollars a week for all these years so this man could have this opulent ostentatious lifestyle i'm done and and he told me um after that he would never refer to him as anything other than tubby when he was you know hubbard was tubby from then on but it, right. it, it, nice man but he said that in the first thing he was given i think pretty much you know he was there when the brainwashing manual was dictated so evidence as to who wrote it whether it was barrier or hubbard he was there so of course was um it was typed up by henrietta de wolf um but he also gave sanborn the hymn of asia and sanborn spent 20 years not wanting to publish it because it starts i am maitreya and in the end john realized if he made it a question am i maitreya then the arrogance level you know was depleted a certain way of course right i i came from the buddhist tradition so as soon as i encountered scientology i'm being told he's maitreya and i'm kind of going oh yeah and i wrote to the pali text society this is the first week i was in scientology so i wrote to the, you know that they've been translating these texts since the 19th century and said it says you know he's red-headed he comes in the west two and a half thousand years after um gatama shakyamuni uh, siddhartha uh is this true and they wrote back and went no uh, in the book of the great decease which i subsequently read there is this vague statement that there may be a buddha who will come and take all of humanity into nirvana that will be the end of the wheel of suffering will all be gone so I, the idea that he latched onto this thought and then made up these stories about you know it'll be in my time red-headed person in the west this is complete right. fabrication, but it says something about his grandiosity. This source, founder, Maitreya, you know, Antichrist, Lucifer, the beast, that, that he had this, this sense of, I think from a very early stage that he was a historical figure, that he was a really important right. human being. And in the end, what we're left with, I mean, you and I have both come to the conclusion that we don't wish to practice this thing. Um, and here he is i think ultimately you know marty rathburn's insight was correct that that he wanted to be he wanted to be worshipped he wanted to be seen as a god mm -hmm. and he was so far from that yes and it got worse as time went by and even the even the public relations you know that was part of their job is to put that image across so that people would kind of look up and worship him yeah. and consider him godly and and in all those years that i worked for him i was with him for like 11 years pretty mm -hmm. much nearly every day yeah. you know except for if i went on mission or liberty or whatever and in those 11 years there's only probably two times i recognized a sort of ot ability you know, where as a spirit, he did something. And that was when the two teenagers coming back from his session got killed in the alley behind Asho. And it was this is, found this to is be the murder connected. that's sometimes linked to the Manson family. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. And, and it was considered one of the man Charles Manson's people had done it. And Hubbard, Bruce when Davis. he found that out, yes, when he found that out, 
he he had me close the door to his office and there's a glass door and there's windows. So I'm sitting outside and he sat there with his eyes closed. And then when he was done, he then wrote a note to Mary Sue, had me take it to Mary Sue. And it was to tell the geo where this person could be found. Mm. And a few days later, he said to me, they got him. And he'd gotten a report from the geo that they had gotten the guy who was responsible for the murders. And that was, he felt that was from him giving directions as to where this person could be found. Of course, no, nobody was convicted for those murders. It, it's still a matter of, of rumor that Bruce Davis oh, okay. may have committed them. He Did was it? he was living in a rooming right. house on Beacon Street, is it, in L.A., where where these poor kids were, and they were stabbed in a way that was said to be, you know, like the Tate Labianca murders. But um, although right. Bruce Davis did go to prison, uh, it wasn't for those murders. So, you know, whoever the geo found, they didn't find evidence, unfortunately. Right. Well, whatever the geo found or said, it acknowledged to him mm. that what he had said was correct. Yeah. So I, that's the first time I thought, oh, mm. he can do, you know, he can do something spiritually, <laughs> you know. And then um, when we were living in La Quinta, mm. so this was many years later in 77. Yeah, this is 77, where 70, Calif California and the tech, tech films are being made. These, these dreadful little films that have all been, all disappeared. <laughs> Which, as yeah. I remember, there's one with David Mayo in where he says, now, children, if this film disappears, you'll know what happened. And I think we do. <laughs> you know. Sorry. Yeah, all those, they were terrible films. But anyway, there was, when we would go from the other location of the base there up to where he, where Hubbard lived at Rifle, it was still, there was alfalfa fields and tamarisk mm -hmm. trees. It was just no houses, no nothing to get from one location to his house. Mm. And at nighttime, there was no lights because you're walking through alfalfa field and tamarisk trees and so forth. One for one, every messenger or person that would go at nighttime, there was a corner. We all were like, oh, my God, did you see that murder going on at that corner? Every one of us saw mentally the, mm. a picture of a killing happening at that corner of Indians. Anyway, one of the messengers mentioned it to Hubbard that that corner was scary for everyone coming through. And it was right at a point where when you take the turn, you didn't know if you're going to turn into the ditch or on the, on the path. And you fall in that ditch, you're scrambling out, and you've got this image of these Indians, this killing going on. Anyway, so it was mentioned to Hubbard. And again, he sat there with his eyes closed. And then he, he opened them up and he said, okay, they're gone. And they were gone. Mm -hmm. None of us had a problem with that corner again. Mm -hmm. So those are the two kind of OT ability things that I recognized. Mm. but other than that no i never saw an ashtray stand up in the chair or you know anything like that no and it, which is it's, it's one of the things that's fascinated me i, I mean as an aside I, I too was involved in a an exorcism uh before i got into scientology a, a young woman kept seeing her departed addicted partner on a balcony whenever she was walking home and and i had no idea what was going on but i sat down with her and um, somehow whatever that presence was she she didn't report it again so i'd just like to say that i can equal her on her but in in that particular right <laughs> okay good um and who knows i i you know i'm an agnostic I, I i i just don't have the time to believe things anymore it's just too complicated you know um but it it what a thought that in 11 years th this man who who's making such incredible claims let's you know go back to ot8 and what ot8 was meant to be that you would be at cause over mental and physical matter energy space and time it's a promise made in the early 70s 
And I think it's the thing that led David Miscavige to spend $11 million and 24 years having Pat Broker followed because there'd been this statement about these 15 OT levels above OT7, out of which this 10, 11, and 12 was supposed to come. And I think, you know, I believe the first thing he did when he took over was seize all of Broker's filing cabinets to... Yes. And I think he was looking for this stuff and he thought there was something there. And of course, they're absolutely stuck. The bridge ends at this level where nobody has, you know, this ability to be at cause over um, physical matter energy space. Oh, and time. You and I would not be alive yeah. if they had those powers. It's very simple, you know. Exactly. But Hubbard, Hubbard even said back in the 70s when we were on the ship that he'd had a breakthrough with his research and he's figured out OT8 through 11 or 14 or something at that time, you know, and that was on a different path of OT abilities because that was during the days of the old OT7, yeah. which got replaced in 78 with the new, new era, era of dynetics for, for OTs. OTs. Yeah. Not, yes. It's not. And, and then that, that replaced the old the old um, stuff, which apparently I, I was talking to Trey Lotz or something, and I said, whatever happened to him? And he says, oh, we still deliver it out here in the independent field, the old OT levels. But I guess in the church they just stick with the net for OTs and go that route. So I don't know why. David Miscavige hasn't spent money trying to figure out, well, what's where's all this other technology that Hubbard apparently had? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think he probably has invested a fair amount of money in trying to find that. As I say, $11 million in surveillance for yeah. 24 years but, from Pat Broker. But those old OT levels were simple. And he's pro Miscavige is probably very complex and... Not finding the simple stuff. <laughs> but, but again, you know, when we look at the, you know, the, the claims that, that used to be made on the bridge until 1974, when it was realized there could be legal problems in making these ludicrous claims. Yeah. Um, the old OT7 was, was meant to be that you would be stably exterior from your body and able to, you know, perceive. And I've yet to meet anybody who even claims that. Um, I've certainly yet to meet anybody who can demonstrate it. Um, and so those old levels were not achieving the highfalutin goals that have been laid out for them. And I would say that actually none of Scientology achieves what it claims to achieve. So, you know, communication releases cannot communicate freely with me. Yeah. They cannot communicate well, I, freely not... on any subject, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to go into what people gained and didn't gain and so forth, because everyone has their own belief on that, where people do feel that they have achieved that or whatever. So you and I agree. Uh, on I, that. I just kind of, yeah, you, I kind of leave that alone. If somebody feels that they achieve something, then that's fine. They achieved it. On the other hand, where a claim is being made, like a clear will never have a cold again. And we can see that that's not true. <laughs> they then, right. I mean, I was talking to Karen LeCarrie a year or so back, and she said whenever she says, you know, Scientology doesn't do what it claims to do, people say, but didn't you have any wins? And it's like, I have wins from being alive. You know, I realize things on a daily basis, yeah. usually to do with, you know, how inadequate my intelligence is and things like that. But, but nonetheless, I realize these things. And within Scientology, the, so much is built on the idea of euphoria, very good indicators. And when we right. step back and look into the psychotherapeutic world, which we were never meant to do because the psychs are evil, we find that there are standard expressions for all of these experiences. So, for example, um, the idea of exteriorization and hundreds of people I've interviewed have said, well, they felt as if they might be out of their body. Yeah, they didn't sort of go over there and describe things but they had this this sense it's called depersonalization in psychiatry the sense that you're you're no longer in your body when the world around you starts to melt as it does of course during training routine zero because of the gansfeld effect which is a neurological effect whereby if there's nothing coming in you turn the 
you turn up perception and you start getting feedback from the system. So if you sit in a completely dark room within 10 minutes, you will sense things moving. You will hear things. And that's your brain. It's not anything that's happening around you. So when that happens, where people start seeing things floating in colors and what have you when they're doing training routine zero, it's, it's called derealization. When we get into the very good indicators, I think we all know that when you get high, euphoric and you know, hypomanic or, or happy, that your perception doesn't work. You know, the cold light of day being able to reason. And so I think often with Scientology, what happens is these are exercises that will make people feel euphoric, but it's just euphoria. Right. It's not, you know, a, an ability gained. They cannot actually, you know, look to the source of problems and make them vanish. They'll still, when it comes to service facsimiles, you know, Scientologists are making other people wrong. It's just unbelievable. Um, with OT3, yeah, we, get, were, yeah. we, we were promised with OT3, freedom from overwhelm. You'll never be overwhelmed again. I remember talking to Mike Rinder about that and saying, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try working yeah. in the seal. But, you know, <laughs> but it, if people get a benefit from it, they get a benefit. Absolutely. Exactly. And I remember as a kid at St. Hill, you know, every, all these people are on the clearing course. And I remember Pan Piercy. They, these people would sit around and talk about exteriorization and Pam Pierce, he would talk about, oh, a spaceship landed and I went in and visited the spaceship. Or my mother would talk about going off and visiting the moon or, you know, and it's like, this is what I grew up with hearing. And <laughs> these were their wins mm. of, from their auditing. And I don't know if they're making it up or what, but, you know, my mother was involved in it. So I've always trusted what she said. To me, my mother was probably the most perfect Scientologist example or example of what a Scientologist is supposed to be. Yeah. She was probably the closest to that. Yeah. And she was the most beloved person in Scientology. There was her and John McMaster. And I personally don't think John deserved it, whereas everything I hear about your mother, you know, she was a good woman. Um, th there is this point that, you know, for all of us, um, Ron Hubbard wasn't the first person to put forward the idea that we live in our representation of the universe, our own universe, he called it. I'm right. told Im Immanuel Kant put this view forward in the 18th century that there is the world outside and there's the world as we represent it. And having seen how easy it is, for example, to develop a false memory in somebody, um, mm -hmm. within a matter of minutes, you can get somebody remembering a, a childhood experience that didn't happen. And when we start asking people to get into their past lives, I started, you know, while I was still involved, I was kind of talking to people, I have a reasonably good memory. And I'd realized that I got people who were in great graphic description, remembering things that happened you know, 33 trillion years ago. But if I'd asked them what they had for breakfast yesterday, they probably wouldn't remember. And I started feeling that there was something a little bit bogus going on here that the imagination and the memory replay on the same screen. Because when we remember things, they're not actually little mental image pictures at 24 frames a second. We reconstruct memory. So when we remember something, we rebuild it. And Every time we remember it, we tend to alter the memory a little bit, which is called the multiple yeah. crafts theory. And so in Scientology, you're, you're given this, you can go into your imagination. You can be, you know, this super being who in past lives was, you know, I'm working on, you know, I'm absolutely the last two, three months. I, I've, it's why I know that Bruce Davis was the guy who was accused of the teen murders, because I've been working on Charles Manson. And mm -hmm. that suddenly struck me that the 14 months of auditing that he had when he was in prison, which, which is attested through Scientology's own documents, they, the red box was, was got by the FBI on Manson. And that what started Manson off and what is most, probably the most significant element of, of, what, of why those terrible events happened is that when he was in prison, he had past life auditing and he decided that he'd been jesus and he actually 
acted out the crucifixion in front of his followers when they were taking LSD, right. which must have been really pretty horrible. Um, but he, so in Scientology, people will get this idea. Talking to Karen de la Carrie last year, she said that she knew of at least 200 people who had been Jesus in a past life. Of course, people yeah, are going I, to I, I they get too. this, you know, imaginarium that, that yeah. you so easily move into. Well, I, I even remember on the ship in 68, we had an engineer who thought he'd been Jesus and he used to put his fingers in electrical outlets to get a charge. <laughs> Are you, there were some weird people. There were some weird people. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of people who think they were Henry VIII or Queen Elizabeth the First, and you know, everyone come, everyone's got to be someone famous. So, well, and of course, if if body Thetans is right, and we've all got millions of them, then we probably have all got you know a little bit of the Buddha <laughs> and and the devil in us. I I don't really know. This has been great. Um, let's do it again in a couple of months' time or something if you have the time. And and I'm yes, wonderful collection of boomerangs, by the way. You know, I hope oh, thank you. Noticed that. <laughs> beautiful. So great. Um, thanks so much. Okay, Janice. well, thanks, John. And, okay, uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.